welcome back to the Zeitcast, my friends. Today is an episode I've really been looking forward to, and I've been excited about a few lately, but this is definitely one of the ones I've most anticipated for a couple of reasons. Um, my guests today on the show are not only two of the finest scholars that I know, they're also two of the best people that I know. Um, for many of you, neither of them need an introduction, but Dr. Chris Green is one of my very best friends. A lot of you know him already. He's going to be doing a separate podcast with me in the next few weeks. I've asked me to do a solo show, of course, but he currently is a professor at Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida. He's written many, many wonderful books that you must read. Uh, Surprised by God being the most recent, which I love, uh, The End of Music, um, uh, Toward a Pentecostal Theology of the Lord's Supper, uh, uh, sanctify, sanctifying imagination, sanctifying, sanctifying, sanctifying interpretation. Uh, Chris, sorry. Uh, I love you, you. If you're not familiar with Chris's scholarship, you really, really need to read all of his books. And I'm just excited to, also because I don't think Chris and Brad have ever met before. So it's great to make that introduction because one of my favorite things is to introduce favorite people to each other. So Brad Jerzak, you already know because he was with us a few weeks ago. And Brad, of course, uh, Dr. Brad Jerzak, also uh, is a professor and written many wonderful works. Uh, we just talked about a more Christ-like way and in a few weeks ago on here, but pertinent to some of the things we're talking about today, I always tell people, uh, has written the best book on hell that exists and uh, her gates will never shut. So Brad, thank you so much for coming back on the Zeitcast. I am thrilled to have both of you guys with me. Yeah, Great to finally to connect with Chris. This is wonderful. Thanks. You're a good connector, Jonathan. Appreciate it. He is. He is. Yeah, and I, and I must echo that with the the gates are never shut book is yeah everybody should be reading that for sure. Thanks, Thanks guys. for that, Brad. Thanks for that. Yes, and speaking of books, a good lead in because um, I just had this conversation two days ago with, and I think I can speak for all of us here with one of our theological heroes. I think I know Brad and Chris well enough to say. We've both greatly been influenced by the work of David Bentley Hart. He's an important theologian for us in so many ways. Uh, y'all can probably hear when I talk to him the bit of reverence there. You know, like, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, since today we are doing a bit of a theological review of that "All Shall Be Saved," which you know, again, I'm not trying to steal in their thunder, but I think while we'll share our thoughts, uh, I, I think we would all say this is a really important book. I think kind of a monumental work. I think it's an uh, just just a critical piece. But I will say right out of the gate that for any points of disagreements uh, that we might have, I will send Brad or Chris to talk to Dr. Hart about it, <laughs> 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 to have the debate. <laughs> yeah, sure. Can you That's imagine be being fun. on the wrong side of an argument with David Bentley Hart, right? Like the, the master of the theological insult. <laughs> right. Yeah. And not only that, but relatively speaking, I, I, my caveat today is that I, I, I am fully aware that I'm an intellectual midget next to him. And so uh, my, my, you know, I, I really agree with what he said on your show the other day, that as far as I can see, his arguments are really irrefutable. And I don't believe the conversation on this topic should proceed without reference to his book in the future. That's I feel that strongly about it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, and maybe that's a good place to start in terms of, because, uh, brother, that is a strong thing, thing to say is that um, in the future, that there shouldn't be conversations on this topic that do not refer to this book. Uh, so maybe kicking over to you, Chris, why do you think this this work is so important? Yeah, well, one of the things that he did that I felt really was extremely important, absolutely essential, in fact, to the gospel itself, is, is that he founds his arguments on the character of God and the truth uh, within Orthodox theology, and I'm not just saying Eastern Orthodox, but the ancient patristic faith and the faith once delivered is that God is good, period. And that the very nature of God is love. And so I really appreciated how he took that, the image of God so seriously. That matters to me a lot. Yeah. And then also the words themselves. Um, so he made this profound argument that if we're going to call God good, or if we're going to say God is love, and then you assign things that are clearly not good or love as if they are, um, then th that's just so out of bounds that it, it actually makes words incoherent. And even mm -hmm. though we're using human words that are 
certainly limited in their power to describe an ineffable God. They have to mean something. And I found that really resonated with me a lot. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I would start there too. I mean, b- both of those things I think are right, that he keeps the vision of God central. He shows us how theological language works. I think he even clarified some of that, Jonathan, when he talked with you, made it even clearer that theological language is analogical. We can't speak about God literally, but even though it's analogical, we still know that good means good and not cruel. Yes. But good can't be made to mean cruel. So yes. good might be excessively good, more good than we can imagine, but it's not other than good. And I think Very that's good. really important that he clarified that. I think another thing that's important is that he addressed the topic theologically. Like one of the things that often happens, even by theologians, and I, I think it's hard not to, the topic of hell can be, it's so emotionally charged right. for good reason, right? That these conversations can can really devolve into just kind of speaking from your guts about what seems right to you. And, and again, I do the same thing. I mean, I think I've, it touches me really deeply as well. But he made some very sound theological arguments about, yes. about what it means to be a person, about what judgment must be, as well as what God's character must be. I think those four meditations work well together to show this is not just sentimentality. And that the accusation has always been that people who hold to some version of universal reconciliation are really sentimentalists. I mean, even Augustine yeah. dismisses, more or less dismisses people by saying, you know, they're, they're the ones, they're the merciful ones, which is just mm-hmm. code for they're soft hearted. They're, they're mm-hmm. unwilling to actually think clearly about these issues. And I think mm-hmm. Hart and I, I'm sure he would have a joke about this himself. Uh, he's not, he doesn't seem to be a particularly sentimental fellow. And no. so he, he, he writes from a place of theolog- theological argumentation about the issues, which I think is important as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the flip side of that is sometimes, it's, you know, he could be accused of just bring, coming to it philosophically, but his meditations went into the scriptures. Yeah, and so... Um, in a way that I thought we're taking seriously the scriptures that he has very carefully translated yeah. with an enormous backstory of yeah, that's training so in true. biblical and, guess, and classical Greek. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so um, almost to the point where I'm like, I cannot see how an, an infernalist can affirm these scriptures. I can see how Hart can. I can see how a proponent of ultimate redemption can take these scriptures seriously, but when he starts laying out this catena of, of biblical foundations for his arguments, I'm like, I, I don't even remember how I would have handled these as an infernalist. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't seem possible. I had that exact thought actually reading that his whole section on scripture is trying to think how would I've even handled these texts before? Because that is one of the things I really appreciate about this work is that, and you know, because Hart's such an elegant writer, maybe the most elegant theological writer that I know of. I think at worst, if you want to criticize him in other places, some people would say like sometimes he just kind of buries you in avalanche of words or adjectives or whatever. And one of the things I like about this book, and Chris and I talked about this a little bit, and in this regard, it reminds me of The Doors of the Sea, is that um, there's a precision to it. You know, he really shows his work, uh, theologically speaking. Um, So I feel like, you know, every line patches, uh, you know, kind of packs a punch. And when he gets into the biblical stuff, like, I don't know, I just feel like there's real, there's real weight to those, to those arguments. We probably don't want to go there yet, but I do think one of the things to talk about when we talk about the biblical section is, would it have been good for him to talk about the hermeneutic he's using a little more explicitly. So for instance, mm-hmm. one of the things that he's assuming is the Bible needs to be read in Greek by people who know Greek and know Greek in a particular way, not just people yeah. who learned the language, but people who know ancient culture. And I think that's, that's a pretty bold hermeneutical claim to make mm-hmm. and needs to be, we need to think about that a little bit mm-hmm. before, before we say yes to it, because that puts a, enormous burden on people to to learn the language and again not only learn language but become experts in the the cultural milieu in which that language operated right Mm. and so do we want to make this reading dependent upon that knowledge 
Mm. I, I think it obviously helps him. I mean, that's part of what he brings to this discussion that no one else can bring, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a little bit to me like N.T. Wright, who's another, you know, kind of superstar who kind of uses his particular skill set, right, to unlock scripture in a particular way. But then when you start thinking about sending that on to other people, I mean, not everybody's N.T. Wright and not everybody's David Bentley Hart. So do we really want to make these arguments dependent upon that level of, of knowledge? And mm -hmm. I, I, you can probably tell from my comments, I'm pretty uneasy with that. I don't, I think there's another way to get to where he wants to get reading those same texts mm -hmm. without having to appeal to, to that knowledge as grateful as I am for what he did. I mean, I think, thank goodness he did share what he knows. I think it helps, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to make it dependent upon that. Mm -hmm. I, at least I don't think I do. I may be jumping ahead in the conversation. Sorry about no, that. No, not at all. Brad, you look like you were going to respond. Go ahead. Uh, that sounds right to me. I, I would I would say I'm grateful that he offered himself as a guide through it to help yeah. make clear what I would not have seen clearly by myself necessarily. And that does raise a question of do or do we or don't we need rabbis to guide us in our reading of scripture? And actually, mm -hmm. that's a quite ancient tradition. Yes. Well-founded. Oh, and, mm -hmm. and I, I would definitely... If that's the approach we take, then I, I think, yes, we do need people. We, I don't want to flatten hermeneutics to everybody alone with their Bible by any means. Right. I, I, so I don't mean that. I just wouldn't want to make the, the kind of saliency of these arguments dependent upon that. I think someone could, and I think people have, come to these same realizations without knowing what he knows about Greek. I mean, I think that's the, his way is illuminating, and I'm grateful for it. Thank goodness for Rabbi Hart, as we'll call him from now on. Sure. But, but I, I just, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really a footnote, but I think one may be worth making. And just one more footnote. I want to footnote, Chris, earlier, this, the idea of the objection around sentimentalism. Yes. Um, what I did see in Hart's arguments was, was humanization. Mm. So yes. it's sort of like, yeah. I'd, I'd want to say, no, you don't get to talk about hell without talking about actual people going there. Yes. You can't make it so abstracted that it's like, well, we really can't talk about hell except unless we have a cold heart. And so you would see some of his passion come out there no, and I just agree. say, no, it's not empty sentimentalism, but it, but he's also not allowing for empty dehumanization on the topic. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. I think it's exactly right. And yes, I'm, I mean, I'm in agreement. Exactly. Brad, I know uh, Brad has published an excellent review of the book and a lengthy review, um, which I thought was quite wonderful. Chris, are, are, you're in the process of writing a review as well. So um, I, I do want, clearly, we, we think it's important work, but I do think talking about um, disagreement, different approaches would be would be important. So for all the things that uh, that we all love, where do you guys push back? Chris, do you want to start? No, you, you go first. I'd like to hear what, you, what you're going to say. Okay, so I suppose the agenda, I want to say my agenda up front, and that is to defend Hart's arguments and his orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. To me, it's if you're going to call what he did universalism, we really need an adjective for that. And I mm -hmm. would call it patristic universalism, but I think there's probably better terms for it. Here's why. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely convinced that he holds to the essentials of the gospel that include the problem of sin, mm -hmm. the necessity of the incarnation, the importance and necessity of the cross and the resurrection, a forthcoming judgment and mm -hmm. the importance of a willing response of faith. So I see all of that in his work. And I think that's incredibly important. Here's the problem. He didn't seem to realize, and he said this in your program, that the broader use of the label or moniker universalism, now the, the dominant use of that actually by both proponents and opponents that would denies some or all of those essentials. In other words, he's doing something important and accurate in my opinion, but when I talk to pop universalists, they they would disagree with some of those very essentials. So, so a denial of those essentials becomes associated with the term universalism. And what happens then is the moment he says, I'm a universalist, 
people go, oh, you don't, so you don't believe in sin. Well, yes, he does. But, but Jesus doesn't really matter then, does he? Yes, he does. But, okay, but the cross you don't take seriously. Yes, he does. And all the way through, including the necessity of, of judgment and a, and a willing response to the gospel, he takes all of that so seriously. But the term itself, because of its dominant pop usage, to, that I think we need to take seriously too. Yeah. It's like, if this is how people are using it, no wonder they would switch them off right away in their minds. Mm-hmm. And so, so while I don't disagree with his arguments, I feel like universal ism has become an ism that denies some of the things that are foundational to his arguments. And so mm-hmm. I've been told, look at Brad, if you want to make this case, you can't use that word. And mm-hmm. so I don't. And it's not just that, well, we got to preserve that word. Like, why do we have to preserve that word when it's become something else? So that would be one one of two points I want to push back at. But I'll pause there and just see how you all feel about that. Mm. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I actually agree. I think the, the label universalism in my circles – ends the conversation. It, it, yeah. you don't, the first time you use that word, the conversation is over. So yeah. I think whether heart, a lot of my response to the book is not so much a critique of the book itself, but an anticipation of how the book is going to be received. Right. Yeah. And so it's, I'm not sure it's a fault of the book. I don't, not every book can speak to everybody. And he obviously didn't write this for Pentecostals. The, the, my students were not his audience. Right. So, yeah. w- but when my students encounter this book, as Brad's already said, they're going to assume some of them will, will, will think, Oh, he's a universalist. He's on my side. And we'll have to say, no, he's not on your side. And others mm-hmm. will say, Oh, he's a universalist. He, he, he doesn't believe in Jesus or sin or the cross. Mm-hmm. And, we'll, and we'll have to also correct them. So I, I agree. We need different language. We really need to say, we don't mean, he doesn't mean what you think he means when he talks mm-hmm. about all being saved. So I, I, I agree. I, and I, I think, you know, there are different terms that have been thrown out. Um, Brad, what, what's your, what do you typically use? I, I say they're ultimate redemption. Okay. Um, and what, one of the reasons I like that term is like redemption is necessary. A yes, redeemer right. is necessary. And there is a means to that redemption. And that it, it acknowledges that there is a passing through processes, including judgment, that gets you to there ultimately – and what it, I so I like the redemption side of it because because it brings in the gospel, but I also like ultimate because then it makes it very easy for me to say there's all these other sets of texts which are exclusionary texts that you are shut out, that you are sent away, you're in outer darkness, and then I can say all those texts belong. And by the way, Hart was great on this. He's like, they're not a contradiction. It's just where they land in the arc of redemption. Yes, and yes, so yes. the condemnation texts are are penultimate, yes. and the universal texts are ultimate. And so that's the language I've started to use. I used to talk about hopeful inclusivism, but that's another critique I have of Hart. He forgets what hope means in the New Testament suddenly mm-hmm. when he's critiquing that. And I'm like, no, you're fair enough. Uh, maybe that hasn't been a helpful label, and I have to shift. Mm-hmm. So when you hear Hart using hope language, it just sounds too weak to you, I'm guessing. Well, that's what Especially he's accusing he's Bo- Bar- That's what he's accusing von Balthasar of. He's yeah. so when Hart translates the New Testament, he's very aware that Paul means that Christ is our blessed hope or the, mm-hmm. the books attributed to Paul treat hope as that Christ is the referent that he's the hope and he's the glory and Paul's not vacillating. So I see that in his mm-hmm. translation. But then he doesn't give Balthazar the same benefit of the doubt, and he treats the hopeful universalists as if they're doubtful universalists or or waffling. Or mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't think that about Paul. So let's mm-hmm. look at Balthazar. Von Balthazar actually says this. Um, yes, we hope that all will be saved, but you know, it is infinitely unlikely that any would reject this hope. And I'm like, if words actually mean something, which Hart has convinced me of, then infinitely unlikely means like there's no chance that Mm -hmm. people would reject the hope. So I like to say, or I used to say it this way, at least, I'm a hopeful inclusivist. Mm -hmm. And my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not doubtful or wishful. It's It's, my hope is 
is the objective reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that is what I took from von Balthasar. Yeah. But if even Hart can't see that, then I think maybe I do need to give up that as an adjective hopeful. It, mm-hmm. It's, it is too weak then in his view. And so maybe, but, I, and to be fair, I've used it as a way to defend myself against charges of universalism that, yeah. So that's what I'm up to there. As von Balthasar did, and maybe just to give context to listeners um, who might not be aware of this book. So von Balthasar wrote a, a wonderful book called Dare We Hope That All May Be Saved, where the essential, yes. and von Balthasar within the Catholic Church was charged with being universalist. This is essentially his response, which, and y'all correct me if you feel like I'm oversimplifying. Oh, thank you, Chris. That's helpful. <laughs> von Balthasar I, I read it again you know, essentially wants to say... Uh, that, you know, no, we don't know that all will be saved, but we hope that all will be saved, that we pray that all will be saved. But um, Brad, I, 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 even having read your review, and I've honestly thought this when I was reading the book at the time, I feel like that's just, that's a, that's a really fair critique of heart because um, he just, he seems to interpret hope and von Balthasar's use of hope as tentativeness somehow. It's like sort of an intellectual timidity and I just tend to think that hope is a more robust word than that. I, I, now, now, I do think what maybe is bound up in hope and the way von Balthasar used the word hope is a kind of, you know, humility to be sure. Uh, and I think that, uh, but at the same time, I do think, you know, hope is robust. Hope for von Balthasar is explicitly, I think, grounded in the character of God and in the goodness of God and, and, and in Christ and like all of that. So, you know, and I'm never... I'm never going to object to his rough and tumble style. Like I love it. Like, you know, and when he goes, when he goes hard on Calvin and all that, like I'm just completely down, but if all the kind of like riffs, it was some von Baltasar stuff where I'm kind of like, ah, I just, you know, I'm not offended. I just don't know if it's a fair, I just don't know if it's a fair reading. Yeah. And I may be overstating it as well, you know, like to be fair to, to heart about that, you know, maybe I, maybe my idea of hope is more robust than Baltazar's too. And mm. it just seemed to me that, that von Baltazar's and, and heart come together on the idea mm. that a free will response is necessary, but your will must be freed to make that response and it will make that response. And they're both rooting that in Maximus, mm-hmm. the confessor. Certainly. And uh, I, I'm all about that. I'm, I'm like, I would call it a freed will response f-r-e-e-d mm. and um so i think maximus is the guy on this and 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 mm. so when B- von baltazar uses him that's what convinced me and then when hart uses mm. him i'm like hey wait a minute that's our guy it's like okay mm. maybe really it is our this is a meeting point mm. mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think it's interesting that the last so in that that dare do we dare to hope or can, can all men be saved the baltazar book dare we hope that all men be saved the last originally the last chapter of the book was called the obligation to hope for all. Yeah. Mm. The obligation to hope for all. So obviously he doesn't mean, I mean, he can't, that doesn't make any sense if he's just saying we should wish for it. He says yeah. we're obligated by the gospel to hope for all. And then he ends that book with a long quotation from, I just forgot her name, but the Catholic philosopher who died in the Holocaust, Edith Stein. Mm-hmm. And in which I mean, she, I mean, she's unrelenting in terms of what, what she thinks this means. And she's a Catholic, right? And so a lot of this is intra-Catholic issues, right? Where mm-hmm. they have, unlike Orthodox and unlike Protestants, they have the magisterium to deal with, the magisterium that seems to have affirmed that infernalism is, is dogmatically true. And so he, Baltzar has a burden to deal with that we don't have to deal mm. with dogmatically. Right. And, and I think Hart is a little unfair um, given that additional burden that Balthasar has. This is another reason why I like avoiding any label that uses ism, because what what the my understanding of the Orthodox Church is that we can believe that all shall be saved, but we don't teach it as doctrine. The creed doesn't go that far. Mm-hmm. Um, however when I actually was pondering heart statements and the Nicene Creed, for example, here's the eschatology of the Nicene Creed. He shall come again in glory. He will judge the living and the dead. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come, period. Actually, that's what heart is saying. 
And so I, I'm revisiting. It's like, can we teach that as doctrine? Um, do I need to be careful about this? And I noticed that Father John Baer gave a glowing endorsement of the book on the back cover. Mm. And that I take note of that. Mm-hmm. Here's a guy who's willing to say, actually, we can teach this because it is in alignment with the Nicene Creed. And that's the thing I've been avoiding all along. Am I just saying we can believe it, hold it as a conviction, as theologumina, mm-hmm. but I suppose here's the limitation. If you teach it as a doctrine, then you're saying then, then infernalism would be a heresy. So and the creed's not doing that. The creed is careful not to land too hard so that you could be an infernalist, a conditionalist, or a, a, a universalist, and you're still in bounds. It's still an in-house debate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could I... Could I... This may take us a little bit off track. Do you want to stay here, Jonathan, or is it cool? No, this is good. Please, Chris, lean in. Go for it. So, the, when I teach this, I always say that there are, there are basically three viable Christian options in terms of what the tradition has allowed within the the confines of creedal commitments. <clears throat> and I think what you're calling universal redemption or ultimate redemption, I mean, is is certainly one of those. One that I don't think is a legitimate option is eternal conscious torment. Mm. I do think we should call that a heresy. Mm. Cool. I do not think that that's, I think you could be an infernalist and argue for an, a, an eternal hell in some robust sense. Yeah. But if you, if you take that to mean torment, then I think at that point you have distorted the faith to the point that it is, it's actually not a viable Christian option anymore. Like they, and so like you see someone like C.S. Lewis, the way he gets around this, right, is that he's, he sees hell as locked from the inside, but it's not torment. It's what they want. God is giving people what they want and they're pleased with it. They won't take anything else, right? Ah, so God's Lewis not has, the agent of the torment. That's what I mean. Yes. Ah, right. okay. That's, that's the issue. Like if you have God as an eternal tormentor, mm-hmm. I, I don't see how that's a Christian option anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, wow. Good. You, you, maybe, maybe you could, and you're pointing to this, Brad, maybe you're saying, I could torment myself forever, but then that's un- unthinkable. I mean, what human would purposely torment themselves knowing there was a way out of that torment and not mm-hmm. take it right forever. Now we're not talking about seasons of self destruction. We're talking about, inf- you know, infinite self destruction. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that, that seems unthinkable to me, like philosophically just m- meaningless. So I think if you want to do what Lewis did, I, I, I disagree with it. I think he's wrong. And I think he's wrong on theological and biblical grounds. But I I think that we have to be charitable enough to say that is a viable reading of the tradition. Mm. But to me, when you cross, to me, the, the tormenting is a red line. Like that, mm. that's something else. Wow, good. Can I, I just want to add something from the eastern end of this that um, that in the West, it was often like, Heaven is where God is. Hell is the absence of God. Heaven is heaven is glorious. Hell is this lake of fire torment. In the Eastern tradition, it's a bit different. The river of fire that flows from the throne of God in Daniel 7, it is, it, God is the consuming fire. It's Hebrews yes. 12. And so then the fire, you experience the fire of divine love as heaven if you love love. And you experience the fire of divine love as hell if you hate love and you can't escape his presence. Yeah. So here's where I would jump in. Then, and there are some Eastern thinkers who would go, and this will be your permanent state. My mm. perception is, and I think this follows Isaac the Syrian, is that the fire of love is effective. And so it wouldn't torment you forever because it transforms you. It's a refiner's yeah. fire. It's a cleansing fire. fire. Yeah. And it yeah. it can soften your heart from hate of love to love of love. And, yes. and it would be ridiculous to me to think of the infinite fire of God's love being ineffective on a hard heart. It's like, come on, think yeah. about it here. Yeah. That's, so, and that's, that's Balthasar's point, although he doesn't use that Eastern, those Eastern categories. That's his point, is, is God is is unrelentingly good. How, how could we not at some point relent? And I mean, that was, that's what changed my mind. I was reading George MacDonald's Lilith, which is a fantasy novel for those who haven't read it about hell. And I mean, I, I was raised in an infernalist culture where hell was central. I mean, Jonathan, you, you pointed this out a little bit when you were talking to, to Hart the other day that, I mean, 
hellfire and brimstone was at the heart of what we did. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I heard more sermons about hell than I did heaven, for sure. I heard more sermons Absolutely. about hell than I did about God, for sure. Yeah. And hell was was maybe the motivating factor hmm. for living the Christian life, right? The, the the fear of hell being the motivating factor. And so that's how that's how I was raised. That's all I knew. And then I read one novel and immediately mm-hmm. realized I, I don't I mean, it was I, I never got over it. In a couple of days of reading, I realized I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I believe this, right? And, and then I read his unspoken sermons and then Gregory of Nyssa and so on from there. But the I think for me, so much of this was just the realization that this is about the character of God. And mm. Lewis was comfortable saying something that I just, I can't say. Lewis essentially says God loses in the end. Yeah. I mean, Lewis says the reason hell is locked from the inside and God is always trying to get in, mm-hmm. but can't because we won't let him. And, and, and Lewis just says outright, I mean, very bluntly in his Problem of Pain book, the chapter on hell and Problem of Pain, God does not get his way. God does not get what he wants. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the question. Do you think God gets his way or not? Mm-hmm. And what do you think his way is? So like the double predestinarians say, yes, God gets his way. And what he wants is justice for some and mercy for others. Most people are taught that God doesn't, in our circles, are taught that God does not get his way. Like mm-hmm. that God is defeated in the end. Death wins. Death wins. Exactly. Yeah. And I can't, I cannot imagine thinking that any more than I can imagine that God wants to damn some, that he takes joy in the damnation of some. So mm-hmm. I don't yeah. have much option. So the New Testament <laughs> denies that he takes joy in that, doesn't it? It, mm-hmm. it does. It's, yeah. He's not willing that any should perish. And then, and then second, that it does proclaim that he has, he is the victor over death and he now holds the keys of death in Hades and, and death is, has died in the death of Christ. And it also, I, what Hart convinced me of is the New Testament does foresee a universal willing response. So he really defends mm-hmm. the, the, the willing the response, response element. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but the fact that the New Testament foresees that doesn't turn it into determinism or, Correct. you know, it. but it foresees that. And yeah. to me, it's like right there in the text. And now I can't unsee it. Mm-hmm. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. That surely doesn't happen at the, you know, at the edge of a sword. Um, I think as we're having this conversation about, though, because for me, this is really important, you know, and even Brad, when you what you raised earlier in terms of like what people hear versus what, you know, someone like Hart's actually trying to say. Um, And Chris, even our conversations over the years about McDonald, that idea of purifying fire, um, I actually find in its own way to be quite terrifying. I mean, the purifying fire is intense and real. I mean, I think in this Absolutely, life and the life yes. to come, like this is not lightweight. It's why, you know, I mean, Hart and Ga- I know Hitler in general has become kind of a trope, but since Hart kind of uses the Hitler trope, because that's where everybody wants to go. Um, I mean, I said already in kind of talking about the book, like I think any reference to that has the word universal in it, and immediately people have this idea of like, oh, so, you know, like Hitler just wakes up in the lap of Jesus. Like, no, no, like this idea of like, that, that, that purifying fire, or if we do encounter the love of God from a place of resistance, like that's a fearful thing. Like that's a, that, that, you know, judgment is a fearful thing in that way. Confronting your true self always is. And I think like that, that's, that's the part for me that I find the most in, unfortunate is that kind of slander. I feel like you're doing kind of like the, the idea that there's no, you know what I'm saying? That judgment here is not still robust and serious or a thing to be taken seriously. Cause like, actually when I read like about fire in McDonald's sermons, in some ways there's a part of me that like finds that to be more intense than the kind of, you know, definitely than all the inferno business. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I think just to make this point, I mean, to reference C.S. Lewis again, right. He has that famous passage where he talks about Jesus temptation and he says, the fact that Jesus didn't sin means that he experienced temptation more deeply than any of us do. Yeah. Because we yield to the temptation before we've experienced it all. Oh, wow. I think the same, lo- the same logic applies to hell. If you're purified by hell, I'm writing a piece. This My review for Hart's book is, is entitled right now, God is hell, God is heaven. Mm. And this is the point I'm making, right? That if, if you let hell be the fullness of the wrath of God against evil, 
then you're experiencing that fullness. Mm -hmm. Whereas if hell ultimately fails to bring you to the fullness that will transform you, Mm -hmm. then you're not experiencing the the fullness of judgment. You're experiencing a judgment that never reaches its fullness. So I think, yes, I think your intuition, Jonathan, is exactly right. That what, what Isaac Nineveh or Gregory of Nyssa are saying about purification mm-hmm. is that the fullness of God's judgment must be experienced. Mm-hmm. We don't get some of God's judgment, God's judgment held in reserve so that we're forever kind of caught between the yes and the no. We mm-hmm. experience the fullness of God's judgment, the fullness of the no, so that we can say the yes. And yeah. I think that this should have been stressed. I wish Hart would have stressed that even more in the book. Mm-hmm. And I think in terms of the people that I will be teaching from the book, that's one of the things I will say. I will go beyond the book to say we have to insist upon the fullness of judgment and that the mm. people who are arguing for infernalism do not believe in the fullness of judgment. Mm. Wow. Wow. Because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't in the end, if it's eternal conscious torment, it does. It fails to consume evil. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Wow. Yeah, it's, so, it's kind of like... I mean, think about the difference between, and I mean, I think I've been convinced of this since I heard George MacDonald say, God corrects, he does not merely punish. Yeah. So that punishment is a failed form of correction. Wow. Right? And the full judgment of God corrects. Mm-hmm. A half judgment would punish. Mm-hmm. Sorry, it's early in the morning, but I'm fired up about this. That's Man, brilliant. That's Chris. really, that's good. I hope you write a book by this title, The God is Heaven, God is Hell, because... I haven't heard it stated so clearly. That would be so good. We would welcome that. <laughs> it I reminds mean, me of Saint Macrina, the younger. That's yes. Gregory's older sister, right? And and so for her, it's like, first of all, from Mark nine, we all pass through the fire. Yes. It's not like Christians are off the hook from the judgment. Nobody enters the kingdom of God with one remnant of attachment to world the world system and yeah, right. the flesh. And she talks about it being like. Um, you, your entire life is you've erected this house created out of your attachments to the old world and the old system and, and your fleshly longings and the things that you grip so tightly. And when you die, the house collapses on you. Yeah. And now Christ walks by and he hears your cries and love compels him to pull you out and everybody out. And he must do it because this is what the love of God requires in his own nature. But as he pulls you out, it's like, this could be a very painful thing if you've been impaled by rebar and you've got splinters up your back, you know, and, and, um, <laughs> and, and the degree to which it will be a torment is the degree how, how tightly I'm hanging, clinging to these attachments. And that's why it could be a lot tougher for a self-righteous person than let's say an addict who has really come to the end of themselves. Or so like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm all in. And he's like, no problem. And it'd be an easy passageway into the next life or through that judgment. But to those who even cling to their own righteousness and rightness, it's like, Oh my goodness, this could be, this is a, a great and der- terrible day. But it's a great and terrible day of truth and reconciliation Yes, that leads to ultimate redemption. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I do think my most, the, the hardest pushback I have about the book is that I think it's a, it's, so we could talk a little bit about tone, although I, I'm, I'm of two minds about that. I'm, I'm with Jonathan in that I, I love this about Hart, that this is his style. And I think there's something fun about it. I think there's something actually that's really a way of respecting your opponents is that you're willing them to give your best attack. Yeah. And if they're, if they're up for it, they can come back in the same way. And I feel like he's pretty good at taking the counter punches. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't really, I'm not quibbling with that style, but I do think there are ways in which there's some people who will not be able to, they did, they just can't take that. They won't be able to take sure. the tone. And so we need to be able to talk about these things for those people too, I guess. So I'm, I'm kind of double-minded about that. But the point I, I was I was going to make here is that I, I do feel like there's a way in which the book just a little bit underplays how serious evil is and how mm. it, it must be dealt with. Yeah. And, and I think that because he's so fiercely opposed as I am yes. to this, what he calls morally cretinous idea of eternal conscious torment, right? That is to him just obvious. It's obvious that you could never believe that, right? And, and again, I'm with him on all that. Yeah. But I do think there are points. I mean, he, he does point to, you know, evil must be destroyed and all that. But 
I think for me, so much of the, the cry of my heart for ultimate redemption is there's so much in this world that is so wrong. Yes. Something has to deal with that. And again, if God, it's not just that it's not just about me and my relation to God and will I believe or will I not? Will I submit or will I not? It's can God do something about the things that were done to me and the things I did to other people? Yeah. Right, too often, and Lewis missed this entirely. Lewis's entire eschatology was about the individual right. believing and not believing in God. And that's quite, not quite fair, but too much of it was about the individual and, and God. And we're missing the ways in which evil mostly is about what we do to each other and what is done to us. Yeah. And if God can't deal with that, then he was wrong to have made things in the first place. Like, because that's, out, that's outside the free will conversation. Right. That before any of us freely sin, we're freely sinned against, unfreely yeah. sinned against. What's God going to do about that? And if he can't deal with that, then I, I feel like then our faith is vain. Like yeah. I, I don't I that's why for me the argument isn't even so much about yeah. the individual in God. It's evil in God. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's fair, Chris. And I think you know, I've even had the thought, and again, saying this as a super fan, but whether it be hard or how it was, or a lot of people that, you know, whose work that like we love and admire, I think there are always, there can be a critique even of, you know, in sort of a, just a very white Eurocentric academic context, like um, the, the weight of the problem of evil and the problem of real injustice does have to be taken with a certain kind of moral seriousness, you know, and it isn't just about, you know, so I, yeah, I think, so yeah, I, I hear that in terms of like really feeling the weight of that, which I, I think there's room for that in Hart's arguments, I, it, yeah. but I don't know Absolutely. that it's in the book. You know? Yeah. And I mean, if you read his doors of the sea and then read this book, yes. I think it's pretty clear where he stands. So yes. I don't, I, I'm not sure this is a fault of the book. So don't mishear me. Yeah. I'm not saying Hart screwed up. Right. I'm just saying when I read the book, what I come away with is two things really. One is God don't, I, I, I said this, this is really pious, but I'm going to say it anyway, since we're friends, the, um, this book moved me to pray, but I, one of the things I found myself praying was, God, help people to hear it and not yeah. to be turned away from, yeah. from it by the force of the rhetoric, right? So yes. I think so much depends on who reads this book. Yeah. There's some people who need rhetorically to be punched in the mouth, yeah, and then there's some people who can't be. And so I have a kind of instinct for those people. Yeah, there's also some of us who've been punched in the mouth for 20 years, and now it's nice to have a bigger guy come and beat up the bullies. <laughs> yes. And, no, and no, you're no, kind of like, yeah. I know you shouldn't beat up bullies. Uh -huh. but I kind of felt good because uh -huh. they they bullied me for so long, right. you know. And right. but I do want to if I want to come back to something super important here about about the seriousness of evil, and I think that the. The solution to that is not so much dialing up the fires of hell, but it's mm -hmm. dialing up the the power of the cross. Yeah. yeah, and come. So when people tell me, "Oh, yeah, forgiveness is too easy or redemption's mm -hmm. too easy," I'm like, "Let's let's take a moment to pray." And here's what we're going to do: I want you to look at Jesus Christ on the cross and just go ahead and tell him that was too easy. Mm -hmm. And he's like, uh, "No, it wasn't." And so there is a sense in which. Um, if if eternal conscience torment, if, if we need that to be enough punishment to overcome evil, well, a it doesn't overcome evil. Yeah. Um, and I'm not and I'm not saying that the cross was punishment either. It, ex, it except it maybe in this way that God in Christ endured all of human wrath from all of history. Yeah. In that moment, He drew it all up into Himself and endured the whole thing. Um, and that, that so. Now that doesn't say everything about the cleansing fire that we talked about already, mm -hmm. but I, I do want to say that that's how I would start with my pushback against those who think we're taking sin or judgment too lightly. Yeah. It's like actually uh, we uh, let's let's talk about it the cross first and mm -hmm. and, and the power of the cross yes. and just what do you think you're going to supplement that with? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? let, let me clarify just a little bit, just yeah. just so it's clear what I'm saying. Sure. Back to my comment about torment. What I find unchristian about torment is not that there's pain. Mm -hmm. It's that it's a pain that has no purpose other than itself. Right. Yeah. 
that seems to me to be, as Gregory would say, unworthy of God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what to me makes it outside the pale yeah. of the faith, right? But when it comes to de- God dealing with the evil that has been done by us and to us, then what I, I don't foresee hell as punishment for those things. In other words, I don't think the rapist goes to hell to be punished right. for the rape. I think the rapist comes in counter with the nature of God, the fullness of God's being mm. in such a way that something about the person, the rapist himself, mm. and about what he did to the persons he did it to is actually transformed. Yeah. Yes. So for me, eschatological hope is that history as we know it is not history as we will know it yes. when God is all in all. So what has happened in my past isn't past for God. Right. And part of what we mean by hell is that God's wrath will come against the things that to me are in the past, but to God are not in the past. Yeah. And what has happened will be transformed into something else without ever not having not been. It's not that God will erase the past. But I think God will actually transform the things that have happened. Mm-hmm. The Holocaust, rape, mm-hmm. murder, betrayal, these things, you know, Judas's betrayal, mm-hmm. all of these things will, they're not over yet. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I mean. So I'm yeah. not talking about punishment <laughs> for punishment's sake. Yeah. But hell is just another name for the creative work of God in destroying yeah. evil. And nice. I think, I love what you said, Chris, earlier about if you think about, and I would highly recommend this book to folks too, if you think about this as almost a companion book to The Doors of the Sea and put those together, because I think The Doors of the Sea deals with a lot of this as beautifully as anything that I know. I quote it all the time. Yes, so I think yes, like especially, yeah, yeah. you know, in terms of just how God is, you know, takes the weight of all of, of all the pain of the, you know, that we've inflicted on each other and how God makes that right. So I think that, uh, Absolutely. I think that's instructive as well. I did a couple, a couple quick thoughts. And then I want to ask you a, a, another question. Like, um, one thing I find interesting, Brad, and it's interesting even hearing you say that about it's sometimes good to have, you know, somebody who could bully the bullies, because I specifically have thought about these things before, Brad. One of the reasons that I love not only your your book so much, uh, but then also just kind of who you are is I feel like when you talk about these things, there is a tenderness that disarms. So that whole question of tone and demeanor, it's OK, just so the heart interview has been out. I don't know. A uh, day and a half now. It's been so interesting because I found a, a lot of people, I'd say the vast majority of people, of course, the book just came out Tuesday. So people, for the most part, have just heard the conversation. Most people enjoy heart, find them endearing. I think probably those, some of the responses I would get on the interview would not be unlike the book. Uh, people who feel kind of on the wrong side of the arguments. He's arrogant. He's insufferable. Yes. You know, yeah. uh, like, how could you even take, like, they, they find the tone like grating in that way. But uh, it's interesting. I do like, you know, Chris, to your point about kind of being of two minds about the tone, because like, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, I get that. And I love tender and disarming. And I want to do that too. But I also have that side in me that like loves the heart comes out swinging so hard. And, and so anyway, it's just interesting to hear you say that in particular, Brad, because I feel like, you embody that that other spirit, and yet it's also fun to hear you say. But I really <laughs> like that he comes out swinging so hard here. You know, <laughs> yeah, it is a guilty pleasure, <laughs> <laughs> with an emphasis on f- a feeling a little guilty about it. <laughs> well, can I can I say this too? Yeah, I think I think another thing that factors here is the three of us do work that Hart doesn't do, and that we have pastoral kind of yeah. responsibilities yeah. he doesn't have. So I think that it's not, I don't really think his tone is problematic when you remember who he's talking to. Sure. Right. He's talking to other scholars of his weight class. Yeah. Right. Like this is not, it's kind of like if you've got a, if you're a professional boxer, when you're with professional boxers, then box. Mm -hmm. My point is some of our people are going to walk into that ring Yeah. (laughs) and they're not professional boxers. Right. So some of this to me is just about translating. Sure. I'm not faulting him for his tone. Yeah. Like their peers, if they don't like it, they can respond in kind. Right. right? Right. I mean, that's part of being an academic. So I, yeah, I don't, I'm not, it doesn't make me queasy because I know he's an academic talking to academics. Right. Fine. 
But I'm not only an academic talking to academics, and that that shifts the conversation for me. Totally, and that's it too. I think just grappling with the with the translation. I I have one other question I really want to ask, but because this is more in this in this line of of conversation, I have to ask just for fun, because and of course he does this uh, other places, but because in this book, Hart, I feel like maybe more than ever has such a field day with Calvin. We talked about von Balthasar a bit. I want to know if you guys think his reading of Calvin is fair. Uh, Chris, I think, after you. Yeah, I'm sure. I'll go first. I, I think yes and no. So I think his reading of, of Calvin's doctrine of double predestination and the doctrine of hell that that entails, I think is fair. Hmm. But there's a lot more to Calvin than that. And I think it would, like if, if I, what I would want to say is, of course, that's, but it's like, to me, you've got, Chrysostom or Augustine, you've got these men of, of kind of magnificent intelligence and spirit who say, especially Chrysostom, horrific things about violence to women. Yeah. That so I would say, you know, Chrysostom's sermon on First Corinthians eleven, um, he says to the women who are being abused in his community, he says, mm-hmm. you know, you shouldn't be being abused, but Jesus died for you. I mean, what are you complaining about? Well, that's just wicked. I mean, and he's a saint, right? He's he's one of the most important men, figures in the tradition. Mm-hmm. But that's wicked, right? And so what I would say about Calvin is there's a lot more to Calvin than that view of mm. hell. Now, I think the difference is, and I do think there's a difference, Calvin's view of God mm. is, is deeply problematized by the way he thinks of double predestination. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot more problem with Calvin than with Chrysostom, you know, in my analogy. But... There's also still a lot in Calvin that I think is worth engaging. Mm. And I, I don't think it would hurt Hart too much to just say in passing, here's what I love about Calvin. Here's where the problems are. Mm. So that's what I mean by yes and yes and I no. see. Yeah, Brad. I was a five-point Calvinist for a while, and I immersed myself in Kelvin, and I defended his version of penal substitution in my MA thesis back in the day, which I've now renounced. <laughs> Um, Publish so, that. Oh, we want to read that. Oh, it's just <laughs> awful. And and so um, so one thing I've noticed is that uh, modern Calvinists often try to get Kelvin off the hook and say, "Well, was it really Kelvin? Wasn't really the problem? It's just the people who came after him, the Calvinists." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not I'm like, no, either. no, no. I am immersed yeah. in Kelvin. I know. I know this that there's something horrendous there. I, I'd have less patience for him than than Chris now, and that's partly because I'm an ex smoker on Kelvin, right? Mm, and yeah, how, how that goes. <laughs> um, but the, this idea of, of um, the aspect of making God the agent mm. of eternal conscious torment and and calling that good that is yeah. the problem, Definitely. and and it's not just a Kelvin problem now, but like through through Jonathan Edwards, it became the dominant vision of of evangelical eschatology, and and even when we got rid of predestination kind of language, it it still makes God the monster under your bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Edwards for me is even more interesting because I think there's a lot more redemptive in Edwards than there is in Calvin, but I think the worst parts of Edwards are worse than the worst parts of Calvin. Mm. So the, it's hard. I mean, I, I think it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, and may, and maybe, you know, I, I mean, I'm willing to be talked off, uh, talked off this point, but there's a part of me that wants to keep my Calvinist brothers and sisters in this conversation sure. by saying, yes, I see what you see in Calvin and like too. And I'm not ignoring that. I'm not, I'm not only going to see all that's wrong. Although I think, I mean, I'm not a Calvinist and never was, right? So that's the difference, right? Right, right yep. between you and me, Brad. <laughs> but I, I do, I do work with a lot of people and and friends with a lot of people who, you know, their knee jerk response is, well, when you dismiss Calvin's doctrine of God or predestination or penal substitution, it's because you don't know how it fits into the overall mm-hmm. work, and that's not that's not true. I mean, I I do have a pretty good sense of how it fits into the overall work. Mm-hmm. I still find that abhorrent, right? Even though I can also say, I think yes, Calvin here and there is is beautiful, right? And it does. 
yeah. Anyway, and of course we have people. I remember, you know, going lectures. Of, if I think about Marilyn Robinson or something, of course they're elegant versions, you know, that uh, that, yes. that transcend the source material or reinterpret it in ways that are more helpful than others. Precisely. I just thought that would be a fun question to ask you guys. I, I did want to ask because, again, the conversation with Hart himself hasn't been out long. But this is probably, of any pushback, this is the sentiment I've heard most. And I just think it's interesting. And I'm curious as to what either one of you would say about this. What about people who will say, if in the end all are to be redeemed, then what does it matter? Like someone said that to me on uh, on uh, on Twitter. Yep. Like, why don't if, if that turns out to be true, then why don't you just shut down your church and stop trying to pastor people? What does it matter if in the end somehow God ends up redeeming everybody? Your turn to go first, Brad. Okay. Wow. I first of all ask, have you not met Jesus yet? Like he's the most wonderful thing that has ever happened to me. What? We're not going to tell people about my best friend who's changed my life and redeemed me from so much of, of the hell I've already been in. So that'd be the first thing. It's like uh, having encountered Christ, I, I don't understand that question at all. Mm. And then second, um, have you not gone outside and seen the human condition? People are perishing. This is a current reality. And so I'm thinking through Gospel of John stuff yeah. that, that perishing is the human condition, and it's really awful. And Christ is eternal life, and knowing him is the response. And so, so knowing Christ and knowing how broken people are, uh, don't leave me thinking, well, then what's why bother? And then the, set, the subset of that would be, and if there is ultimate redemption, there is a means to it. Yeah. And that means is by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to people yeah. and calling them to respond to the care of a loving God who they really can trust. So it's not an end without a means, mm -hmm. but it's also not just an, an a someday end after you die. It's like today, here and now, do we have a gospel? Yes. In fact, if there were no afterlife at all, I'd ask the same question. Mm -hmm. Would we want not want people to know Jesus, and would we not want Him to address this the disease of of their souls with the medicine of His life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. I don't think it does matter, and I think it's it's beautiful that it doesn't matter. Mm. God's life doesn't have a purpose; mm. like God doesn't exist for a reason. Mm. Love doesn't have a purpose. We don't love people because of things. I mean, if I started telling my kids, you know, I love you because you perform well in school or because you're athletic. I mean, that's obviously perverse. I love my kids because they're my kids. Yeah. God is God because God is God. There's no purpose for that. So the, this world doesn't exist for a purpose. God didn't create for a reason. Mm -hmm. God created because he's love and he loves us. Mm -hmm. Period. Wow. The moment you try to make this into some kind of game, you've perverted it. It isn't, it isn't about having a purpose. That's the whole point is that there's no purpose other than God being God and us being us and God loving us mm -hmm. and us loving each other. That's all there is. So of course it doesn't matter. It's perverse to even ask the question. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to respond with that. Tweet that <laughs> <No>. back at you. <laughs> it's no, but I'm serious. It's perverse like, it's, to it's even sick. ask the question. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> it is. It is perverse. No, I, Sorry, I man, I'm, I'm you know, feeling anointed right now. Well, yeah, actually, that does feel anointed <laughs> to me. And I tell you something. You know what it points to, and I do say this with sadness more than anything. Because, I, and on the whole, and you know, I said this towards the end with Dr. Hart, and I didn't want to be too, you know, I'm not trying to be all mystical about this or something. But we've we've with both of you, I've had many conversations in this direction. I truly, in my deepest self, believe that we are in a time where if there's if there's any kind of reformation that's happening spiritually, it's that I do think that there's such a revelation of the character of God that's coming through all Christian traditions. And it's not surprising to me in that way that across Christian traditions that this kind of conversation is happening. I do think, Chris, to your point earlier, because I do believe that eternal conscious torment is so, it is just, it's so horrible in how it maligns the good character of God. It, I just, I hate it that those of us who kind of teach in this direction, you know, you always feel like you're kind of on the defense, you know, <laughs> when really those are the egregious lies about God and about scripture, yes. you know? <laughs> Definitely. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I think, and that's why I want to, 
press the point that eternal conscious torment is heretical. It's, it's blasphemous. Maybe that's a better word. It's, it is to impugn the character of God irredeemably. Mm-hmm. Then we'll be redeemed <laughs> because of who God is. But it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't think we can afford to be cautious. And I think on, on those points, mm-hmm. right? Like we, we have to be, we have to, that's where we have to be bold, mm-hmm. right? When we're talking about, who God is. I think we, we, we can still be modest about how we understand it all and humble about the way we're going to articulate it. But I think we should be fierce defenders of the goodness of God. Yes. I don't think we should relent there. Yeah. And I, I read something just a couple nights ago by Olivier Clement, who's a, who died a few years ago. He was an Orthodox theologian. And he was, he was talking about how he's talking specifically about how Europe has, you know, is post-Christian. And how he saw this as a good thing. Like this is a, there are all kinds of bad things about it, but ultimately it's good because it's freeing us up, he said, from moralism. And then he says, the future of Christianity does not lie in moral preaching, but in sacred transgression. And I think we're in a very similar moment culturally Mm -hmm. where we're de-Christianizing in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And it's for all the things that are bad about that, there's a lot that's good. Yes. And one of the things about it that's best is it can free us up from being moralists. Yeah. And this is the key. The doctrine of hell is useful for moralists. Mm. That's why they need it. Mm. Yeah. Because they have a certain morality they want to maintain. And hell is the leverage mm-hmm. to motivate people to maintain that morality. And Christians aren't moralists. Mm-hmm. That's not what this is about. We're not trying to, to be moral. We're trying to be holy. Yeah. We're trying to be like God, but something else altogether different. Mm. So I think if we could shift that, if we could shift away from mor- moralism, the doctrine of hell will go with it. Mm. Like that one stands with the other. Mm. I love that. It is a risk because a lot of Christianity is moralism, right? And so if you take the leverage away, will they just walk away altogether? And well, what do you know? They have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's it's all the more reason to to track with uh, Clement on that and, and Chris. There's this funny – I think we also want to push back at the glee around this. So St. Siloan the Athenite, there's a story about him. You know, a priest comes and he's quite gleeful about people going to hell and, and – and, um, and St. Siloan was so grieved by this. And he's like, if you even found out one of your brothers were outside the city, would you not go get him? Mm. Would you not implore the Lord to let him in? Would you not even offer to take his place outside the city like mm-hmm. Christ did, you know, in some say, sense? And and so, and then he, he says, and if you would do that, if you'd be like Moses or Paul, who says, for the sake of my brethren, I'd rather be damned, you know, have you not solved the problem of hell? And then he, he turns it on them. And says, uh, and if you would not, then your heart is iron and there's no need for iron in paradise. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of like, (laughs) if anybody's in hell, just think about it being you. And, uh, but despair not. Yes. (laughs) Why not? Well, because his mercy endures forever. So. Um, That's beautiful, Brad. Thank you. Thank you both of you for sharing that. That's so wonderful. I've just, um, I'm thinking about, and I I know we need to wrap this up just because I want to honor your time. But I, but I'm loving this conversation so much. I think a lot of people will. I'm just, um. I'm moved by so many things and struck, you know, um, just from this conversation. I mean, on the one hand, um, I just, I I will say, because I wonder if this would be helpful for somebody to hear. I think especially as we're talking about, you know, the the goodness of God and the character of God. And I love that story, Brad, in terms of like, you know, even how that should be reflected in our temperament and our posture towards the people around us. I just, you know, I... I find if I can, that might say this clumsy, I find Hart's math to be awfully persuasive on so many levels. But, you know, no matter how you work out the math, if you really believe in the goodness of God, you know, and that's where I think, again, I really do tend to still like so much of the way von Balthasar talks about hope is if the understanding is that hope is in Jesus, you know, hope is in hope. If we know who God is. And God is the one in whom we hope, because I just I'm just aware that, you know, that for so many people who listen to this, they're not just, you know, even grappling with uh, their their own story, or their own history. But they're they're grappling with uh, people that they've lost who maybe were outside the faith or whatever. And this and this conversation carries a lot of anxiety. And maybe that's where I'd like to just kind of end with is any in either any direction you want to go with this is like, 
I'm just like I'm just mindful that there are a lot of people that when they hear something like this, yes, it may be st- stimulating and um, they may enjoy it, uh, the rapport on some kind of intellectual level, but precisely because there's so much tension between where they come from and what they're hearing now. And I, I, I do just feel like a lot of people are probably hearing this from just a place of real anxiety. Like, I want to believe that God is this good. I want to believe that the gospel is this beautiful, but but can I really put weight down on this? What would you say for people who really are grappling in that way, who aren't just necessarily receiving some of this with with hope, but who feel a lot of tension around all this? Well, I would take note of the fear, first of all, and say, isn't that interesting? Um, let's read First John 4 together about perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who's still afraid has not been perfected in love. So let's talk about that. And specifically afraid of punishment. Yes. Yes, that's what's often missed in that text. Yeah, It's not just fear in general, it's fear of punishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I would say, um, I see one of the issues as a desire for faithfulness, mm-hmm. and that it what I'm calling you to might not feel like faithfulness because you're so embedded in an old way of thinking that it, that you're, that makes you nervous. So here's a, here's a measuring stick. Ephesians three. If the, if, if you know one gospel and then you hear another one, which one has, has the wire wider, higher, deeper, longer love. Um, Ephesians three requires you to take the, the one with the longer, higher, wider, deeper love. Mm -hmm. And, and, as far as I can see, infernalism fails that test miserably. So um, it might free them up. Yeah. Sometimes quoting the fathers and say, "Here, listen to the early church fathers, what they say." That that can also help if there's an impulse of conservative faithfulness. Like, oh, you're yeah. not conservative enough. You need to go back further here. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Okay, I want to try to speak to something. I'm not sure I can speak about it very well. I'm trying to write about it in my review, and I'm struggling to find the right words. But I think that a lot of us have been taught that faith is is tied up with the crucifixion of the intellect mm. and the crucifixion of your instincts about God. Mm. That I think there are a lot of people who believe in hell because they feel like they have to believe in it because the instincts to disbelieve in it are ungodly. Mm-hmm. They, they don't trust their own heart yeah. in that way. Mm-hmm. And they think they've been told that it's, it's godly to kind of crush your own, sense of right and wrong yeah. because God's ways are not our ways and God's the one who's truly just and all my instincts are, are messed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's really perverse. Mm-hmm. Like I think it does an unbelievable damage to humanity of those people mm-hmm. and to the theology that it undergirds. So somehow we have to get them to see that the way God leads us into all truth is never by the destruction of our humanity. Mm-hmm. We don't, he was crucified. I don't need to crucify my intellect. Mm -hmm. I need to tie my intellect to the crucified one. Yeah. But if I believed I had to crucify my intellect, then I'm having to do something over again that Jesus didn't get done. Mm -hmm. I don't, this is not about distrusting your heart as a form of trusting God. Yeah. Like that's not what's called for here. Like, I think if you have deep and abiding questions, Trust that those questions are a way that the Lord is teaching you. Mm-hmm. Don't just silence the questions. Mm-hmm. So I, for people who feel that pressure, I just want to take that pressure off of them right away. Right. Like the, you may turn out to be wrong, mm-hmm. but don't just, don't just crucify those instincts. Don't just rid yourself of them in the name of faith. Mm-hmm. That's not faith. Um, does that make sense? I'm not sure I'm articulating oh, myself. So well. good. Totally. Yeah. Makes sense. I, the, cause I think I was taught that. I mean, I think there's something about, I don't know if it's Bible built culture or if it's Protestant Christianity, or I don't know where it comes from, but I think, I think we believe that it, there's something heroic that God is pleased when we, we think something is right. And then we say, oh, it doesn't matter that I think that's right. God is right. That, that's, that's, I think that's deeply, mm-hmm. deeply perverse and destructive. Like it's not just, there's, there are real consequences, real world consequences mm-hmm. to that disbelief to our theology and our humanity. The other thing is the, sorry, I'm going on so long no, here, but the, the, there's a, there's a lie out there that if you don't believe in hell, you won't have any motive for caring for your brothers and sisters mm-hmm. who are lost, right? That if you, if you remove, so John Piper says something to that effect in his let the nations be glad that 
hell is what we're trying to save people from. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have hell, then we won't be motivated Mm -hmm. to save those people from it. So now you see, it's not just about motivating my personal moral life. It's motivating evangelism. But first of all, we're not trying to save people from hell. Secondly, I think when you know that God will not allow anyone to be left behind, that you're never allowed. I think the doctrine of hell, as we've been taught it, not as it's been taught everywhere, but the doctrine of hell as we've been taught it, essentially says, yeah, it's okay to just let some people go. Yeah. Not everybody's going to be there. Yeah. It's, it's, I think of the story of the prodigal son coming home, mm. and this, this breaks my heart every time I read this story. The prodigal son goes in, and he's having the party. The dad comes out of the party to try to get to the older son. And I just every time I read the story, I think, why didn't the younger son come out too? Why was he willing to stay in the party that had been thrown for him mm. when even his dad wasn't willing to stay in the party mm. because his brother was outside? Mm. And I think as long as we believe in hell as eternal conscious torment, as justice and so on, yeah. there will be a part of us that says, you know what? Some people just can't make it. So we just got to give up on them. Yeah. We don't give up on anyone because God doesn't give up on anyone. Yeah. So come out of the party. Yes. Right? So those people who who've lost people who, who have, you know, people who've died and died without believing God's not going to give up on those people. And neither should you mm-hmm. like that. That's, that's where I would, where mm-hmm. I would go. That hooks up exactly with the parallel right to its side about the good shepherd who goes out to find the lost sheep. And the, the phrase I love is until he finds them, mm-hmm. he's not, he's not quitting. That's right. Ever. Until that's he right. finds them. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, I think that's, that's such a lovely way to end. I think it brings things full circle because one of the things I think is so important about this book is I do think it's, you know, possibly the most, at least for me, the most thunderous case against eternal conscious torment I've ever read. And I think that, you know, and I think that that needs to be heard. And I think Chris, everything you were saying about not leaving people behind away, I mean, that calls for such a callousness, such a detachment. Whereas, you know, another key point in the book is, um, heart reminds us that it is Jesus who asks us to make our relationship with God analogous to our own relationships, how we love our kids, how we're loved by our own parents, like that, that we're exactly. called to think in this way. So those kind of heart instincts that are connected so deeply with how we love the people closest to us, like that's, we're supposed to listen to that. You know, we don't Absolutely. cut people off. We don't give up on anybody. God doesn't yeah. give up on us. There's that line early in the book that is, In a book filled with great one-liners, I think the one that will stay with me the longest is when he talks about the callousness that is a concomitant of deep, that so often is a concomitant of deep piety. This is why. Because if your piety is built around hell, you you build into people the belief Mm -hmm. that God will give up on some people. Mm -hmm. That's what you're telling Wow. God will give up on some people, so you can too. Yes. Wow. And you'll either hear that as, okay, I can release myself of the burden to care for other people, or you'll feel like one of those people God has given up on. Yep. Right. And of course, you won't be surprised when other Christians give up on you too. Yeah. And that is a lie. Like, that's what has to be confronted. And that callousness has to be removed. Yes. Oh, that's so good, Chris. Sorry, I'm, I, I don't mean to preach. No, you can that, pre- I preach that all I, day long, and I'll preach with you, man. That's gorgeous. Anything you want to add to that, Brad? We get an organ. And... No, I just want to say amen. 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 Well, thank you, guys, because I tell you, I've been thinking throughout all this today, and even these conversations the last few days, that there's no way I'd be where I am on this journey without the many conversations I've had with each of you, without both of your work. So thank you for your friendship and your companionship. I love getting to do this together in community. And uh, man, th- this conversation is such a gift to me. That's part of what's I feel spoiled getting to do this podcast, because it really is an excuse to just have all the conversations I most want to have with the people I'm, uh, that I most want to have them with. And like, you know, but I have some sort of formal reason, you know, so thank you for being willing to, to do this today. It's really been wonderful. And thank you guys for listening. Uh, obviously, we all hope you'll read this book because I think it's important. And I hope you will read the reviews of this book, Brad, where can they find your, the, your review? Uh, I think it's on clarion, uh, journal.com okay. or they could just Google why I'm not a universalist, but sound like one. Okay. Jerzak. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And Chris, yours <laughs> is great. forthcoming. It is forthcoming. Yeah. It, it, it'll be here. I don't know. Soon. I hope. Um, the it's going to be on Father Al Kimmel's blog. Yeah. 
So li- listeners may know about that. Um, I forget the, the, the link for it. But eclectic just, orthodoxy. Eclectic orthodoxy. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So if you just Google eclectic orthodoxy or Father Al Kimmel, um, that, that'll that'll come up. And for folks who follow me on social media, I'll go ahead and post the link to yours, Brad, now. And Chris, as soon as yours is up, I'll certainly push it out there. So Because I do want people to engage all this wonderful content. Well, thank you guys for being willing to take so much uh, time today. This has been a beautiful conversation. And thanks all of you who are watching and listening. And um, tell you what, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to do this, but just even um, either one of you, Brad or Chris, who are, I'd love if somebody just kind of close us in prayer because the conversation like this stir up a lot of things in people. And it, that to me seems like a good way to land in terms of just uh, kind of getting back into our souls here for, for just a moment before we we say goodbye. Pastor Chris, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> God, thank you for today. Thanks for the chance to meet new friends and make new connections. Thanks for the chance to reflect together on who we know you to be and what we know you to be concerned with. That I want to pray especially for those people who are afraid that Jonathan mentioned just a few moments ago, people who are anxious around talks about hell Mm -hmm. because they're afraid, afraid of punishment, a punishment that they're receiving or a punishment that someone they love is receiving. And God, my prayer is that you comfort them by showing them who you are, right? Showing them that they can trust you absolutely because you are good, truly good, thoroughly good, utterly good. And whatever they've been told about hell should cannot obscure that, that I pray that they will find rest and that if it's in something we've said or in something that you say directly to them, they will realize that, that they don't have that to fear. That's not anything they have to fear for themselves or for the people around them, that you, you are life and death will not have the last word. Life will have the last word. Pray this in Christ and by the Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Brad. And thank you guys so much for joining us for another edition of the Zeitcast. I'll see you soon.